Imagine women camped in open air for 42 days, today I guess 43 days, defying authorities in cold temperatures, some women as old as 100 years, and children in the capital city of India. Imagine Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, atheists, agnostics protesting peacefully, people from all backgrounds and social strata. People who never protested in their lives are protesting. These protests are <coughs> in opposition to a bill passed by Indian Parliament called Citizenship Amendment Act. In opposition to this law, massive protests are taking place on the streets of every major city in India. Yesterday, not far from here, I was told there were around 3,000 people marched peacefully from White House to the Indian Embassy. <coughs> it was a peaceful, orderly march, men, women, children, and elderly. As big as the crowd was here, the marches and protests in India are many times bigger, regularly, daily, and in many cities across India. These protests are not organized by any political party or organizations. These protests are spontaneous, led by youth, students, and women. An unprecedented number of women, Muslim women, are protesting, defying the authorities on the streets of New Delhi and many cities across India. The only violence in this peaceful protest comes from the police. Police has intimidated protesters. Protesters are beaten with sticks and even shot at with live bullets. Last I heard, the death toll was 28. Yes, this is the democratic India today. The ruling party with its militant nationalist origin is striving to transform India into a theocracy. United States is at war with one theocracy and friendly with another theocracy in Middle East. And imagine a strategic partner India moving towards theocracy. Aside some expectations, exceptions, I will come these exceptions later. The United States government is silent. Given that our government spends hundreds of billions of dollars to gather and analyze intelligence about the friends and foes alike around the globe, it is inconceivable that White House, State Department, and CIA do not know about the realities of this very volatile situation where 200 million of citizens are targeted, potentially to be stripped of a citizenship rights, the right to all rights. It, has, it is hard to believe that U.S. government really do not know about these ever so rapidly evolving civil disobedience, if not resolved, which could lead to a constitutional crisis since most Indian institutions of governance are compromised or at best under duress. Today's expert panel is organized to provide insight to the government, to elected representatives, civil society organizations, think tanks, and American public at large. We certainly hope American public take notice and understand that an unstable India would not make a useful friend. Economically weaker India is not good for US business interests. And with internal strife, India will not be an effective bulwark against Chinese encroachment into American sphere of interest in Asia. We hope that the declaration that says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness have been given to all humans by their creator is not confined to a particular part of the world. The exceptions that I mentioned earlier are Senator Bob Mendes of New Jersey and Congresswoman Deb Holland of New Mexico that we know of so far. Senator Bob Mendes Menendez, a ranking member of the powerful Senate Foreign Relations Committee, expressed concerns in a letter to Secretary Pompeo. He wrote, I urge the administration to engage the Indian government at the highest levels on these concerns press for a swift reversal of these policies and pra practices and ensure protection of the human rights of all persons in India regardless of their religion. 
Congresswoman Deb Holland tweeted that I am deeply concerned about Indian Prime Minister Modi Citizenship Amendment Act, which discriminates against religious minorities. Indian Muslims are being targeted based on how they worship. I urge PM Modi to rescind this law immediately. We are hopeful more congresspersons express similar concerns. This briefing is organized by Indian American Muslim Council. We thank our co-sponsors, CARE, the largest civil rights organization of American Muslims, Engage, Civic and Political Organization of American Muslims, and Hindus for Human Rights, the premier human rights organization of Indian American Hindus, whose one of the patron is Professor Raj Mohan Gandhi, a grandson of Mahatma Gandhi who is known as the father of nation in India, who preached and practiced nonviolence, the inspiration for Mandela and Dr. King. On behalf of IMC, CARE, Engage, and HHR, I welcome everyone to this briefing. We are very grateful to Congresswoman Chakowski for facilitating this room for this discussion. Depending on her schedule, she might stop by for, to make her remarks. First, I invite Wari Hussain. Please, go ahead. Um, thank you, thank you to everyone in this room, and thank you to the Indian American Muslim Council and the other co-hosts today. Um, I think it's especially important to raise awareness um, of the challenges that are emerging in India today. <laughs> oh, there? Oh, okay. Stand up, huh? Okay, is this better? Yeah? Okay. All right, thank you to the IAMC um, and the other hosts today. Um, I think it's especially important to be discussing uh, the challenges that India faces today, especially for American policymakers. And I think this event sort of tries to accomplish that or begins that conversation, which is very important. India is undoubtedly a major trade and security partner for the United States. It shares a common law legal tradition with the United States. It should be a point of pride for many people in this room who are South Asian Americans that Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, the father of India's constitution, developed some of his theories at Columbia University here in the United States. I think that's something that we should all be very proud of since he was the father of the constitution that is really at the base of what can be a defense today against some of the things that are happening. It's also important to note that yesterday marked um, the 71st Republic Day for India, which is the day that the Constitution came into effect. Um, I'm going to keep coming back to the Constitution over and over because I think it's an important point to make um, and something that we can actually use in our discussions with the Indian government and with our sort of partners. Uh, the Constitution of India is a vanguard document. It has led to the protection of human rights by various administrations inside India, but has also been a source of constitutional change throughout the global south. Kenya, Uganda, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, all of these countries cite to the Indian constitution and Indian jurisprudence to essentially defend human rights. So it has a very strong place in its region, but the constitution and the underlying rule of law is under direct and violent threat today in India. Undoubtedly so. The current administration led by the BJP has adopted an exclusionary ideology. This ideology breaks down very simply. There are too many Muslims in India whether because of high reprodu reproductive rates, false claims of love jihad, or illegal migration from neighboring countries. These Muslims, according to the BJP, pose an existential and a security threat to all of India. So these Muslims must be dehumanized, demonized, and then removed from the country. That's the objective here. That's the big picture, right? So sometimes when we're looking at the trees, we forget to see the forest. This is what the forest represents for the BJP. It's an ideology that they're carrying forward with these policies that they have. The outcome of, of this ideology is an avalanche of policies that we've seen in the last few months. Revocation of autonomy for the Muslim majority Kashmir state, the amendment of the Nation's Citizenship Act, or the CAA, the announcement of national registration for citizens or the National Population Register, which is the CAA, the NRC, and the NPR. That's the three things I'll be discussing and what a lot of people will be discussing today. Those are the three laws that are at issue. The CAA, NPR, and NRC have all been explained by the current administration as attempts to control illegal mi migration from neighboring countries in South Asia. It is undoubtedly true that there is a great deal of migration happening inside the Indian subcontinent today. 
It's caused by climate change, it's caused by genocide, it's caused by civil conflict, it's caused by discrimination faced by certain minorities. And this is partly why in 2013, the Supreme Court of India called for a registration of citizens in Assam, um, a, a state where a lot of migrants have gone to. The problem, however, is that the implementation of the NRC process in Assam has been rife with procedural and substantive irregularities. The right to counsel, the right to a fair hearing, the right to be able to actually represent yourself in court so that you can be recognized as, as a citizen rather than as an illegal citizen. Now, all of that is true, and in addition to that, what happens when you're poor and you don't have your birth certificate? You don't have the hospital area location that you were born in because the hospital doesn't give that information unless you pay for it, and your parents couldn't pay for it. You have to have all these documents in place in order to be recognized as a citizen now. If you don't have those documents, you will not be recognized. It's as simple as that. Um, and in addition to that, if one can't prove their lineage and place of birth, under the NRC process, they are rendered ineligible for citizenship. And more importantly, they're eligible for deportation, prosecution, and punishment. Not only has this process been incredibly painful for all of the Assamese citizens, it was done without procedural safeguards like legal counsel, fair trial rights, to assist people in challenging the local registrar's decisions on the due process of their hearings. This has led to many Muslims and non-Muslims being deemed illegal in Assam. But the Indian government has been trying to provide options for these undocumented persons to become naturalized as long and only if they're non-Muslims. Let me say that one more time, just so you understand that. There are additional benefits being given and fast tracks to citizenship and recognition under the NRC and CAA. Those are being given specifically to anyone who's not a Muslim. That's implicit bias, direct bias, and disparate effects. So if there's any American constitutional lawyers in the room, you'll know that we interpret laws based on these kind of uh, I ideas of, is there a disparate impact? Is there an, an increased impact on one community? Is there an implicit bias? I think that this has been demonstrated time and time again that there is this implicit bias with this NRC and CAA process. So. The CAA allows for those deemed illegal under the NRC to be fast-tracked for citizenship. One has to prove two things. They came from a neighboring Islamic country, so they came from Pakistan, Afghanistan, or they came from Bangladesh, and they have to prove that they are non-Muslims. If they can do both those things, they will be fast-tracked or at least be allowed, even without the right um, uh, paperwork, to be able to be given citizenship or recognition. And again, the point is, is that a whole bunch of people are allowed to do it, and one group isn't because of their religious faith. And that's exactly what this law sort of says, right? So further, there are three major issues with the allegedly neutral policy of the CAA. One, the CAA, because it has a list of Parsis, Jains, Sikhs, Hindus, Christians, and doesn't include Muslims in that list of beneficiaries, it is, by its very nature, excluding that group, right? Saying that they're not beneficiaries, so they're gonna be targeted, or they're going to be deemed illegal, or they're going to, going to be subject to these prosecutions because of the fact that they are Muslims. And others who aren't Muslims will be able to avoid those proceedings and be able to get citizenship. <laughs> Second, the justification that Islamic republics in South Asia only target non-Muslims is false, okay? There's a great deal of intra-sect and intra-Muslim discrimination across South Asia, right? This law presupposes that if you're an Islamic country, then your discrimination is against non-Muslims, against Hindus, against Christians, etc. But what happens about Ahmadis in Pakistan? What happens about Shias or Hazaras in Afghanistan? There are actually Muslims who live in Muslim-majority countries who are discriminated against because they're a certain kind of Muslim. That Muslim is not allowed to have beneficia beneficiary status under the CAA, even though they're dealing with religious discrimination, which is what the BJP has said is the reasoning behind this law, right? So the justification of targeting Islamic republics and non-Muslims non, uh, from those republics as beneficiaries is problematic. And the final thing is that non-Muslim countries like Myanmar have carried out atrocities that have led to many Rohingya Muslims being forced to move to India and Bangladesh, and, the similar could be, and a similar thing could be said about Muslims in, in Sri Lanka. But the CAA does not cover Sri Lanka. The CAA does not cover uh, Myanmar, right? So if there's Muslims 
who are being victims of violence or discrimination within their own countries, right? Um, they aren't going to be beneficiaries of this. And if they belong to a country that's majority Buddhist, for example, like Myanmar or Sri Lanka, and they get discriminated against, they don't get to have any beneficiary status as an immigrant in India either. So when you think about it and the ideology and the, and the ideas that are put forward by the Indian government on why this law is important and needed kind of fall apart when you look at these three points of logic. It's also imp important to remember the example of Myanmar here. Um, one of the first and earlier steps of the genocide that took place against the Rohingya Muslims was a discriminatory citizenship law. Citizenship laws are where you start this process of disenfranchising, demonizing, and dehumanizing parts of your citizenship uh, or parts of your um, people. As Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court Earl Warren once said, citizenship is a man's basic right, for it is nothing less than the right to have rights. Remove this priceless possession, and there remains a stateless person, disgraced, degraded in the eyes of his own countrymen. But unlike Myanmar, India does have institutions that can be used to fight back against the communal removal of citizenship, like the courts and like the streets. In other words, there are speed bumps on the highway of hate that Indians are taking up today. The Constitution designates that there is no state religion and it calls on secular policies. It is likely that the constitutionality of the CAA will be challenged in the Supreme Court or in some of the high courts, and we have to see how that's going to play out because there is a part of the Constitution that says secularity is part of our governing principles. This um, law by itself is not secular because it recognizes certain religions over others and therefore could be challenged under that. Then when it comes to the streets, as we've seen, thousands have taken to the streets around the world, not just in India, but ac across, the, across the world to protest the CAA and the NRC. Despite violence that's been played against the protesters, despite the arrest of thousands, despite the deprivation of fair trial rights for those detained, Indians are still coming out in the streets to protest this law, and that's something we should recognize. As American people, as people who believe in democracy and justice, we should recognize when there's those engaging in their peaceful right to protest. So in solidarity with these protesters, um, I would like to conclude my remarks with the preamble of India's constitution. We, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular democratic republic and to secure all its citizens justice, social, economic, and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of status, of opportunity, and to promote among them fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and the integrity of the nation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Waris. I think uh, he pretty much summarized what's going on in, uh, in India. Uh, what I would like to point out is, as Waris mentioned, that the courts may be, uh, it may be challenged in the courts, but the, the courts are under duress, if not compromised, in India. Supreme Court, out of five, four Supreme Court judges came out of the court in the public place and warned American pub, uh, Indian public and probably the world that soon the courts will not be able to give justice. I'm paraphrasing. But the very fact that four out of five Supreme Court judges came out and warned the public that courts are compromised. So we all can hope that courts can do their job. But more and more, there is little hope in American and Indian institutions. Uh, now I will invite <coughs> Sumaya Shankar, uh, a professor and a journalism <coughs> professor of journalism at Stony Brook University. She travels from New York. While we worked out these uh, technical issues, I will invite 
Dr. Sandeep Pandey, who traveled from India all the way on a short notice when he heard that American people, Indian Americans and Americans also are protesting. He is a lifelong protester against injustice. He couldn't resist, so he traveled all the way from India. Sandeep Pandey. I would like to thank uh, IAMC and other friends who have invited me for this, and I'm very happy to be here among you um, talking about what is happening in India. So I am basically an activist uh, for the past 27 years in India. and. I have never experienced in my life uh, the curb on fundamental rights that we are facing presently. Fundamental rights under the Constitution that Varis was talking about, uh, my right to freedom of expression, uh, right to assemble peaceably without arms, uh, right to move around the territory of country. So this is section 19 of the Constitution. In the past six months, I have been prevented seven times from, uh, so three times I was under house arrest on 11th and 16th August on the issue of Kashmir because I wanted to uh, go and participate in a one hour candlelight demonstration. And on 19th December, when there were nationwide protests against CAA and NRC, I was again inside my house and police would not let me go out. Three times on 17th, 19th August and 15th January, the last time with Sunita Vishwanath, she is here. I tried to go to Ayodhya, which as you know is a site uh, where the uh, BJP and the RSS want to build a grand temple for uh, Lord Ram. Uh, so we were not allowed to go there. The police stopped us midway and asked us to go back. Once when I reached Ayodhya on a motorcycle, it's a distance of about 128 kilometers, they put me in a police jeep and brought me back to my home in Lucknow. Uh, so, and on 4th October, when I tried to go to Kashmir, um, ours was the only activist group. Uh, I know that Soumya has been there, but we were prevented uh, from uh, proceeding beyond the Srinagar International uh, Airport uh, Arrival Lounge. Uh, there was an order by the district magistrate, <coughs> Badgam, which said that uh, if we would go into Srinagar, we will protest against the abrogation of Article 370 and 35A, and it would create law and order situation. And therefore, we were not allowed to go. Uh, but I went later as part of a march from Jammu to Srinagar, uh, towards uh, uh, the end of November. So <clears throat> uh, three times house arrest, three times prevented from going to Ayodhya, and one time prevented, to, prevented from going to Kashmir. This kind of thing has not happened uh, in the past. And except for the Kashmir visit, the r remaining six times there was no written order by the administration. So this was all illegal. The police would come to my house and would say, I. We request you not to step out of your house, and we are just performing our routine duty. So without any written orders, they um, you know, stop us from doing things. So it is very clear that the right-wing BJP government does not want any alternative viewpoint on Kashmir, on CANRC, on Ayodhya to be expressed. Now let me talk about the recent violence. Um, uh, in the wake of protests against CA and RC. So the first attacks took place on Jamia Millia University in Delhi and Aligarh Muslim University, even though protests have been going on in other institutions. For example, Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, uh, is witnessing everyday protests. But the only universities which were chosen for attack were where there are a majority of students from the Muslim community. I went to Aligarh Muslim University on 19th January, and I met Muhammad Tariq, a PhD student in chemistry, who has lost one hand. He was still in the university hospital uh, because a grenade exploded near his hand. 
and Nasir has lost a thumb, and Tanzim, who I met, uh, a very thin student, uh, he has got both his hands fractured. Two first information reports, one against 57 people, of which 26 are students of the university, and another FIR in which there are 1,200 unnamed people. Now you have to understand what this FIR against unnamed people is. So unnamed people is, I, the police can arrest anybody and they can put your name in the FIR. So it is in fact a tool for extortion. So I will arrest you and I will threaten you with putting your name in the FIR unless you pay me some money. So this is a big uh, you know, uh, racket which goes on. And one student I know personally, Ahmed Raza Khan, of the Khwaja Moinuddin Chishti Urdu Arabi Farsi University in Lucknow was suspended from the university just because he had, a given, he had given a call for protest. The protest did not take place, but he just gave a call for protest and he was suspended from the university. He still is. He has gone to court, but we don't know what will happen. In Lucknow, where I live, on 19 December, there were protests, peaceful. Protests um, were almost over. And suddenly, mass men wearing a skull caps, they arrived. And in this context, please remember the statement of Prime Minister Naren Modi, who said that the protesters can be recognized from their dress. So these, uh, as a group of mass men came who nobody could recognize. The local people could not recognize where they came from. And they created a riot and arson. And uh, uh, Sadaf Jafar, an activist belonging to the Congress party, um, she was pleading with the police, why don't you stop these miscreants? But the police did not do anything. And uh, after the violence, the police started, this group of mass men disappeared, and the police started ar arresting activists. So Sadaf Jafar, Pawan Rao Ambedkar, lecturer um, from Raibarili, was arrested. My friend Deepak Kabir, when he went to see Sadaf Jafar at the Hajrat Ganj police station, he was arrested. Robin Verma, um, uh, activist with Rihai Manch, an organization which works for um, uh, innocent Muslim youth who are uh, falsely implicated in terror-related cases. Uh, my friend, Advocate Muhammad Shoaib, has fought cases of these youth and got 13 such youth acquitted from the court. He's a human rights lawyer. He was also detained on 19 December along with me and my other friend, retired police officer, Mr. S.R. Darapuri. So Sadaf Jafar, Pawan Rao Ambedkar, Deepak Kabir, and Robin Verma were subjected to torture inside the police station. My senior administrative official friends would not tell us where uh, these people were. Uh, when my wife went to see uh, Mr. Darapuri and Advocate Shoaib, both of them in their 70s, she was detained at the police station. And they wanted to include her name in the FIR as well. Somehow, she got out of the police station. So <clears throat> everybody sent to jail. And uh, all procedures violated. So in India, uh, if you're arrested within 24 hours, you have to be produced before a magistrate. But Shoaib and Darapuri were kept for more than 24 hours at the police station without being produced. Um, before a magistrate, and Advocate Muhammad Shoaib actually went to jail without being produced before a magistrate and without signing an arrest memo. And um, uh, most of them have got their bail now, uh, but the common people whose names we don't know, more than 1,000 people have been arrested. Some of them are still languishing in jail because they can't find a lawyer or uh, they don't have the wherewithal, you know, to come out of the jail. Um, the chief minister of my state, Uttar Pradesh, which is a very large state, the size of this state is bigger than that of population of Pakistan, uh, on 19 December held a meeting with senior administrative and police officials and said, I will take revenge on people who have indulged in violence. And then the police went berserk and indulged in brutal repression. In Muzaffarnagar, another city in my state I visited, houses of well-to-do Muslim uh, families have been vandalized. And uh, we met a boy as little as uh, 13 and a half years old who was beaten. Uh, he is a student of class 9. And his sister, Rukaya, who was about to get married, 
was also beaten and had uh, six stitches on her head. So uh, we were told that hundreds of policemen came onto, into their house and, and vandalized the, the property. In Meerut, another city, 17 people received bullet injuries, five of whom are officially uh, dead, uh, which is, uh, the administration acknowledges, and one of them uh, is, is not acknowledged, but uh, there are total six deaths. Uh, the, the people who have died um, uh, are mostly from a lower socio-economic strata of the society. Uh, we met three families. Aleem, 24 years old, he makes rotis in a dhaba. Muhammad Asif, 20 years old, he operates a battery rickshaw. So this is a three-wheeled vehicle uh, uh, you know, operated uh, by a battery. Muhammad Mohsin, 30-year-old, is a scrap dealer. So such kind of people you know, killed by police bullets. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, met one person in Muzaffarnagar. He uh, uh, is a, a clothes vendor. Uh, to, he uh, was also shot in his forehead. Uh, now, what is important is uh, over 20 deaths have taken place in Uttar Pradesh, but the police is saying, except for one place, Bijnor, police is saying they have not died because of our bullets. Now, this was a protest uh, against the government. It was not a clash between two groups of citizens. There, was, there were people on one side and there were the police and the administration on the other. So in Kanpur, we have heard where 28 people have been injured that police had used private arms to fire. Now, you have to recognize that if they were using their official arms, they would have to account for every bullet they would have fired. So they used private arms to fire, and three people died in Kanpur. Um, I will just wind up because I think uh, the time is up. Um, the overall picture is that even though everybody participated in the protests, uh, I have been participating in these protests, uh, but the administration targeted only Muslims. The FIRs were registered only against Muslims. I have seen three FIRs, one in Lucknow, in which out of 39 people, 36 are Muslims, and two in Muzaffarnagar, uh, in which all the 107 and 151 names are Muslims. And they also include 2,500 to 3,000 unnamed people. Um, now, uh, there is an additional uh, complexity to this. The chief minister has declared that the cost of damage to public property by the rioters will be recovered from them. Now, the set of people who created violence were completely different, these mass men who came. Or in Muzaffarnagar, we heard that the local member of parliament, Sanjeev Balyan of BJP, was leading the uh, attackers. So people who created violence and, and riot were different. But the, because the FIRs have been registered against Muslims, so it is assumed that they are the ones who created all the trouble. And therefore, all the cost of damage to public property is now going to be recovered from them. And my friends have received notices uh, of, you know, rupees 2 crores, 3 crores, um, and, and they uh, are supposed to pay this amount. And, and this is totally illegal because uh, an FIR doesn't mean that the person, the person is just accused. He's not yet convicted. So without even any inquiry, the notices for recovery of uh, costs to damage have already been issued. Uh, um, more than 1,000 people have gone to jail. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, this whole politics is about you know, uh, polarization, communalization, because the grand design of the CA and NRC, which I would uh, like to add to what Waris presented, was that they want the Muslims and poor landless people who would find it very difficult to prove that their previous generations have lived in the country because they don't have their names on any property, um, will be excluded from the voters list. Uh, they are not the people who would normally vote for BJP. And the BJP wants to include non-Muslims and non-Jews from three neighboring countries as citizens because they perceive that they would be their voters. So this is a <clears throat> long-term design strategy 
to uh, capture power, political power in India. And this entire politics is essentially divisive, uh, polarizing, and communalizing. Thank you. <laughs> so good morning. Uh, there's a bit of a technical issue. I'd made a slide for you. I was on the ground um, from August to um, until a few days back covering uh, Modi, uh, Modi government's, uh, you know, misadventures with the Muslim population. And I wanted to show you what I found uh, from the ground. I wanted to tell you some stories of the people I met there. So um, I was there as part of a project by a Boston-based independent newsroom called Ground Truth. And I published in places such as Foreign Policy, Intercept, Baffler, South China, Morning Post, etc. I'm also a journalist as well as a journalism professor. So to understand the implications of of the CA in India, um, I, I uh, went to a SAM where, where the NRC, which is the National Registry of Citizens, was first being implemented. Now, the NRC was a long-term demand of the indigenous Assamese population, wherein they wanted to find out who came illegally from neighboring Bangladesh into India. So, so, so there was a unanimous cutoff date that, that was set. Anyone who came in after 1971, when that country was created, would be deemed illegal. But there were many people who had faced the brunt of, of such an um, ex exclusionary exercise even before the NRC list was, was released. The NRC list was basically a list of all legal residents in the northeastern state of Assam. Now that meant that the burden of proof, <laughs> to, to prove t that you were a resident or a citizen of India, lay on all the citizens. It should have been otherwise. The government could have said, you know, we have a doubt that you're an illegal citizen, and they could have asked those people to present themselves in court. But that did not happen. Everyone was asked to prove their citizenship. So I met um, I met uh, this this 80 year old woman called Madhubala Mandal in in Chirang in 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 a, in, in a small district in Assam, which is known to have you know wild population of elephants, very very poor, illiterate population. She lived in a one room hut, and in some, some sometime three years back, she was picked up from her house. Uh, the police knocked on her door and asked her, "Are you Madhubala uh, Madhubala Das?" And she said, "No, I'm Madhubala Mandal." They picked her up, they took her back. And uh, the next thing she knows, she spends three years in a detention camp in Kokrajar district in Assam for being mistaken as Madhubala Das. Her name was Madhubala Mandal. And she was mistaken to be someone else. You know, and she spent three and a half years in a detention center in Kokrajar. Next to the Chirang district is a district called Golpara, where India is, is building a new detention camp for for, which is the size of seven football fields. There, I met this man called Noor Muhammad. Noor Muhammad is a 61-year-old paddy farmer. He was detained for seven and a half years because he was deemed to be an, a doubtful voter, someone who cannot present his um, his documents and was deemed to be a, a, was disenfranchised from voting all his life. He spent seven and a ha half years in detention center. His case is still ongoing. Now when, now when the final list, final NRC list was released on August 31st, I was there to speak to them both. Noor Muhammad, Noor Muhammad told me when I asked him, if the CA becomes law in India and it is passed throughout the entire country and the NRC, which was experimented upon in Assam first, is is uh, you know taken national? What will happen? He buried his face in his hands and wept like a child, and he said, "Never again." And I hope this doesn't happen to anyone else in my country. I am an Indian. I'm not a Bangladeshi. I spent seven and a half years in a detention center, which absolutely are uh, you know if 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 you compare them to American detention centers, American detention centers are like hotels. Um, uh, you, you know, comparatively, there is family separation. There, there are no human rights. There is uh, very meager food. People go unfed, hungry. There is torture. There are all kinds of slurs that officials use uh, to dehumanize. Uh, you know, some of these people. So. Um, that is basically and roughly the impact of what might happen 
to hundreds and thousands of Muslims across the country were the CAA, NRC uh, experiment to be introduced nationally. There will be many, many Noor Muhammads, but people such as Madhubala Mandal, who are Hindu, will be deemed citizen will be deemed to be citizens of India because of the, the Citizenship Amendment Act. And people like Noor Muhammad, who are Muslims, will be left out to spend their lives in detention centers, stateless, um, probably disenfranchised, and probably as um, you know, an unhomed people within their own land, without a place to even be deported to. So that is what we are facing right now. Um, you know, if, if um, I can see, OK, never mind. So um, OK, so uh, the CA and NRC, so this is why the country is protesting right now. The CA and, and NRC protests in India are an unprecedented show of resistance against Modi's BJP. I've been covering uh, the rise of Prime Minister Modi um, and his political party since before 2013. And I haven't seen anything at this, this scale happen in India before. It started on December 4th. Um, even when the talk of reintroducing the Citizenship Amendment Bill started in Parliament, there were protests that erupted across uh, the northeastern region. Uh, there are 27 people who, who have died, 27, 28 people who have died, hundreds injures, injured, thousands detained and arrested and tortured across the country, uh, like Mr. Mr. Pandey so uh, skillfully told us. Uh, there is a rampant abuse of a colonial era law called Section 144, which is a law barring public assembly in multiple states. There are internet shutdowns in, in multiple states across India, which has you know invited adulation from the world's probably worst freedom, internet freedom offender, which is China. Um, but, uh, you know, it comes on the heels of, of several other moves that, that the BJP has sort of, um, you know, carried out in the past five months. I, I was in Kashmir earlier um, in August, one week after the special status of that territory was taken away. And um, I met Asrar Khan, who was a 17-year-old boy in a, in a government hospital in Srinagar. His face was blasted with pellets at the hands of India security forces. And he was, he was playing at a ground in, in a housing colony in Srinagar when, when an army uh, convoy that was passing blasted children with pellets, thinking that they were protesters. Now, Asrar Khan lay in a vegetative state for one month. I met his parents at that time, and his father was, was a man of peace. He said, we want books, not guns, for our children. One month later, when I was in Assam covering the implications of another policy debacle that Modi's government had, had done, I, um, I heard that Asrar Khan had died. His father, who was a man of peace, who had told me we want books and not guns for our children, wanted payback now. And I saw this transformation across many, many, many people in Kashmir, this change of heart, this absolute giving up with what the Modi government had done to them. Uh, but there were no protests then. There are protests now. So this is, this is significant that there are all India protests now. And there, there are five key learnings, five key points that I that I understood when I was interacting with protesters. Number one, they're organic. They're absolutely organic. No political movement in the country could summon the kind of force that these protesters have, have uh, you know, garnered within themselves in the past one month. They're led by students, women, members of the Muslim community. Uh, it is, I'm, I'm seeing for the first time a selfless kind of motivation where constitutionalism is, is higher than any selfish motive that these protesters could have asked for. Uh, it has given birth to spectacular art, spectacular protest poetry, art, and song. And uh, it has um, united the opposition against Modi, and it continues to rage in spontaneous movements across the country. I would have shown you pictures uh, if, I, if, I, if I had the chance, but, but thank you so much. Thank you, Sumaya, for that uh, report from Ground Zero, I believe. Uh, now I would like uh, our next three speakers to come and sit down. Uh, that would be <coughs> that would be John Sifton from Human Rights Watch and Francisco Bensco, Bencos from Amnesty International and Harrison Atkins from USCIRF. Uh, 
Um, I would uh, invite uh, John Sifton from Human Rights Watch for his. Thanks a lot. So I think it's been explained very well so far what the problems are, not just with the CAA, but with the National Register, uh, the NRC, and the NPR. I want to get into the details, though, for those of you who might have heard some of the claims that the Indian government has made uh, in, by the embassy here and back in Delhi, because I think there's a lot of uh, uh, misinformation being put out by the government, or just simply inaccurate information, and it's important to focus on the details, some of the very important details, just to make sure you can rebut the government, rebut the embassy if you need to, if you're a congressional staffer, a journalist, or whoever you are. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few of those issues and then talk about uh, advocacy here. So one thing right off the bat is to just, Wallace went into this already, but just appreciate that the Citizenship Amendment Act is something that refers to people whose citizenship is already in dispute, people who are, who, who are no, excuse me, who are admittedly non-citizens who are attempting to get citizenship. And in that respect, it only applies to a limited number of people. A lot of people, but a limited number of people. The much more concerning thing, on at least on a demographic level, um, is the National Register of Citizens, or National Register of Indian Citizens, and the National Population Registry. Now these things actually have been on the books for a long time. If you go back to India's citizenship law in 2003, citizenship rules of 2003, they sort of envisioned um, a national um, citizenship registry. Uh, but nothing ever happened. You know, these sort of things sat on the books for a long time. Uh, there was talk in the, in the law of the national uh, population registry, and in fact, there were some efforts made by local authorities in 2010 and 2015 to do that, but these things were much more innocuous than they are now, because at the time, it was simply a matter of collecting a name um, and some few details. Uh, to, to feed into this list, the National Population Registry, which, by the way, admittedly, is not about citizens. It's just population, whoever they are. Things got very ominous, though, only in 2019, when all of a sudden the BJP-led government started talking about this um, effort to, to basically pull together the real National Registry of Indian Citizens, or the NRC. Um, and it emerged that the that the information that would be collected by local registrars would include a lot of information um, about things like who your grandparents were, your parents were, where they were born, and all kinds of things, which, if you couldn't provide, could technically later be used by those local registrars to say, well, you know, I don't think you are a citizen. And so basically, we're, what this is all about, we could talk about the Citizenship Amendment Act, it's very ominous and, and discriminatory and all this, but this bigger thing is much more insidious and slow moving. It has the potential to create a situation where local registers are empowered to do one of the most powerful things a government can do, which is say you're not a citizen anymore. Um, now, is that going to happen? I'm not saying it is. I'm saying perhaps India and in, in Indian civil society will rise up against any real effort uh, for that to actually occur. But what, what I'm trying to just place this in a larger context. Okay, now real quick, we talk about this being discriminatory and, and all that, but I want to get down into the weeds of the international law that's at stake here. Uh, people have condemned these laws as being discriminatory, but let's just get exactly why they're problematic under international human rights law as opposed to Indian law. I mean, of course, under international law, states have the right of granting who's a citizen, and, but, but all of those... Uh, privileges that a state has, um, you know, they don't allow you to act in a discriminatory or arbitrary manner. So let's just get specific about this. First of all, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, makes very clear that uh, you, know, you can't deprive people of their citizens on the basis of race, color, descent, national, or ethnic origin. Um, but more importantly, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the so-called CERD, which India signed in 1967 and ratified in 1968, it explicitly obliges a country, India, to guarantee the right of everyone to equality before the law, equality before the law. 
including in the enjoyment of the right to nationality. Uh, the committee that was created to safeguard that um, treaty uh, specifically, um, excuse me, hold on. I just want to get the quotes right. The committee for that treaty specifically added the deprivation of citizenship on the basis of national or ethnic origin, race, color, all the rest, violates their obligations. Um, and more importantly, in this context, the treaty asks countries to take steps to address xenophobic attitudes and behavior towards non-citizens, in particular hate speech and racial violence, and to promote a better understanding of the principle of non-discrimination in respect to the situation of non-citizens. So in other words, this treaty specifically obligates India to do everything it's not doing right now, which is promote harmony, fight xenophobic attitudes towards non-citizens, uh, there's other things, the 1992 Declaration of the Rights of Persons Belonging to National or Ethnic or Religious or Linguistic Minorities. Um, there are other you know, things I'm not going to go into, but the point is there is an international law foundation to this, and that's why you've seen special rapporteurs and UN officials condemn all of these abuses, uh, th these abusive laws. The reason I brought this all up is not to just say, oh, we got you on international law grounds, but the point is to base them in an international setting that allows non-Indian human rights activists, civil society, members of Congress, whoever, to raise these issues on par with India and not have the Indian embassy say, you don't have a right to raise this with us. It's a domestic internal issue. On the contrary, it's an international issue. These are international norms. And you have every right to raise them, whether you're Indian or not. And with that, I'll leave it. Um, the only last plea I would make as an advocate is, while I'm a lawyer and you know, somebody who believes in international law, I think one important thing to do in the context of this place, the House of Representatives and Congress in general, is to not house these concerns in um, partisan uh, terms, but on international terms. So in other words, don't talk about it, even if you're tempted to, as progressive types of governments first, you know, a neo-fascist or conservative uh, or Republican or Democrats caring about this. I think Republicans and Democrats here in Washington care about these issues. And if we uh, make that clear to the Indian government, I think they're going to be less capable of dismissing concerns that are raised. So just a last plea to not make this a partisan issue, not make it a political issue, make it a human rights issue. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> John, for that. Uh, it definitely is a human rights issue, religious freedoms issue, uh, fundamental rights issue, and uh, I don't think anybody disagrees here uh, in this uh, uh, august audience. Uh, <clears throat> our next uh, speaker is uh, Francisco Benscombs. He's Asia Pacific Advocacy Manager, Amnesty International USA. Before joining uh, Amnesty International, um, he, he assisted Democratic Senators on East Asia, Pacific, South Asia, and State uh, Department USAID oversight. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the Indian American Muslim Council for having me here today. Apologize, I'm losing my voice a bit. Um, but I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, the particulars with respect to the crackdown on protesters. We've heard a lot about uh, international law, about the Citizenship Amendment Act, and even about the foreign tribunals on an NRC context. But it's also important to house this in the context of freedom of association, freedom of assembly, and the ongoing crackdown that's going on uh, with protesters in India right now. And first, I want to tell you the story of Sajir Ahmed. Sajir Ahmed is an eight-year-old um, who his uncle, when Amnesty International interviewed them, told us that Sajir was simply playing with his daughter when he took his cycle and went out. And he must have gone to see the protest. Sajir Ahmed was crushed to death in a stampede last December in Varanasi, India. The stampede was set off by the police assaulting a group 
that was people's protesting the Modi's government new legislation, the Citizenship Amendment Act. The police first tried to disperse the crowd and then went on to lati charge on the protesters, causing a stampede that resulted in his death. For Sajir's family, the police brutality cost them their son's life. The eight-year-old was an innocent bystander to the protester, and after the protesters and the police crackdown on them was over, the family realized that he was missing. It was only until a couple of hours later that they were able to find Sajir's body, unknown as to where he was as the ongoing stampede and protest and violence ensued. The family was heartbroken. Sajir's case is emblematic of how supposedly the world's largest democracy treats protesters and dissent. Amnesty International in the last year has documented case of human rights violations not only in the context of the Citizenship Amendment Act and the NRC process in Assam, but also in the ongoing protest that actually we came out with a report last week. And Amnesty International has documented a clear pattern of the use of excessive force during protest and arrest of peaceful protesters, or persons who claim to be innocent bystanders who were delayed access to legal counsel, differential treatment of assemblies, and bias in police and administrative response. Throughout the country, protests have occurred against the Citizenship Amendment Act in at least 94 districts across 14 states. There have been deaths of at least 31 people who have been related to the violence. More than 110 have been arrested, and then more than 600 have been kept in preventive detention. And it, is, it is understandable why people are out on the streets. The Citizenship Amendment Act, both in structure and intent, is exclusionary and inconsistent with India's constitution and human rights obligation. And it's difficult to view the Citizenship Amendment Act in isolation and not look at the larger picture where both the amendment and the NRC may deprive minorities of their citizenship in India. And if implemented, this stands to create the biggest statelessness crisis of the world, causing immense human suffering. The intimidation and crackdown by the police continues. Many who were injured during the December 20th protest left their homes and sought medical treatment in other areas due to fear of reprisals from authorities. There is constant police patrolling in the areas where the protest took place, even at night when the police goes around knocking on doors with their lathis. In many areas across Varanasi, houses have also been vandalized. Amnesty International has found two instances of the police breaking into houses in the middle of the night to make arrests, destroying property as, as they go through. And the police in Varanasi and other places have induced a climate of fear in citizens' homes in India. One person was quoted as saying, if you're trying to participate in anti-CAA protests, the government will arrest you and threaten you to slap laws like sedition on you. But if you are pro-CAA, you can organize rally and solidarity events. This is not just happening in major cities, but also in rural areas. It is happening in states that the BJP controls police. It is happening in the prime minister's constituency and in major tourist hotspots as well. Arbitrary detention, use of excessive force, differential treatment of assemblies and torture and custody have sadly become commonplace in Uttar Pradesh. The way the state government has by and large chosen to respond to the anti-CA protests has been massively disproportionate, unwarranted, and unlawful. And we call on the brutal crackdown on peaceful protests to end immediately. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister's silence on the police brutality and crackdown has spoken louder than his words. When he has spoken about the protests, he has been divisive instead of healing the wounds of the country. The only clothes I see when I look at the Indian protests are those of human rights defenders, activists, and those who seek freedom from an overly discriminatory law. So we asked here today for the Modi government to repeal the Citizenship Amendment Act and stop cracking down on protesters and ensure that its citizens have the right to peacefully assembly. Sajir Ahmed deserves better. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco. That's uh, heart-wrenching stories right from the ground. and. Uh, I don't know if anybody disagrees here. Uh, if they do, um, it's their prerogative. Uh, the 
Next speaker is uh, Harrison Atkins. He is a policy analyst for South Asia for U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedoms. Previously, a global security research fellow at the University of Tennessee's uh, Howard Baker Center for Public Policy and an Ibn Khaldun Chair Research Fellow at American University. Harrison Atkins. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers of this important event um, and for inviting me. Um, I'm honored to join this distinguished panel uh, with so many leading figures, both from the United States and India. Um, I do want to say we must always remember the great courage shown by those working on the ground in South Asia um, to advance the cause of human rights um, and religious freedom despite great personal risk. So we must remember and, and celebrate their, their brave efforts. Uh, I'm Harrison Akins. I'm the policy analyst for South Asia at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USERF. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, USERF is an independent U.S. government agency created by the International Religious Freedom Act to monitor religious-based discrimination and violations of religious freedom abroad according to international human rights standards. In our annual report, we also make foreign policy recommendations to the President, State Department, and Congress. USERF is led by a nine-member bipartisan commission whose members are appointed by the President and congressional leadership. We have gathered here today to bring the spotlight on a key issue that has sparked great outrage, not only by governments and international organizations, but from citizens of all faiths across India who have been bravely practicing their democratic right of peaceful protest, the Citizenship Amendment Act. In our annual report, various special reports, and public statements, USERF has long expressed its concern that this law is part of an effort by the BJP government to create a religious test for Indian citizenship in line with their vision of a Hindu state. And in conjunction with a potential nationwide um, NRC and NPR, could become a weapon to target millions of Indian Muslims, potentially leading to their disenfranchisement. This represents a significant downward turn in religious freedom that no government, including the United States government, can ignore. Other members of this panel can speak to the specifics of this law and how it is being implemented on the ground much better than I can. I instead wish to place the new citizenship law and the NRC and NPR in the broader context of religious freedom trends in India. And to understand fully the implications of this law, we must see it in connection with the BJP's broader political agenda in line with their Hindu nationalist ideology known as Hindutva. This is a reality that BJP politicians' own rhetoric and explanations for government actions force us to confront. Quite distinct from Hinduism, one of the world's great faiths, Hindutva is a 20th century political ideology born under the indignity and oppression of British colonial rule in the subcontinent. Facing questions of how to define an Indian political identity, Savarkar first introduced Hindutva in a 1923 pamphlet written while in prison. He developed a vision of a Hindu nation premised on the idea of Hinduism, a definition of that religion that is inclusive of Sikhism, Jainism, and Buddhism, denying them their own identity as an independent religion, as a religious, ethnic, political, and cultural identity with special claim to the land of Hinduism's birth. He understands Hindu identity to be more than a religious identity, but an ethnic one, with bonds of blood able to transcend matters of caste and sect. Islam and Christianity, on the other hand, are perceived as foreign religions. In this ideological framework, it is imperative for religious minorities to assimilate into Hindu culture in direct opposition to the secularism enshrined in the Indian constitution. The carriers of this ideology in, in Indian society and politics has been the RSS and its myriad associated organizations known collectively as the Sangh Parivar, or the family of the RSS. Most notably, the collective includes the BJP as the political standard bearer of a Hindutva today. 
Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Home Minister Amit Shah both began their political careers with the RSS. In recent years, conditions for religious minorities have deteriorated precipitously in India. BJP politicians have used the symbols of Hinduism and policies aimed at their protection as weapons against minority communities in their quest to shape a Hindu nation. From instituting more aggressive bans and stricter punishments for cow slaughter and religious conversion activities, minorities are increasingly marginalized and discriminated against. Combined with the BJP's inflammatory rhetoric, these coordinated actions strengthen the perception that minorities are outsiders with no legitimate place in Indian history or society, and by their mere presence, a potential threat from within to the project of making India a Hindu nation. This creates a culture of impunity for violence against minorities by both government authorities and non-state actors as a near daily reality for minority communities in India. Cow lynchings, for example, have predominantly occurred following the BJP's election in 2014. These attacks are often conducted by individuals associated with the Sangh Parivar and take overtly Hindu nationalist tones. It is a sad reality that the phrase Jai Shri Ram has become a murder cry. In the wake of the CAA protests, government authorities have shown their willingness to target the Muslim community, with one police officer in Uttar Pradesh, for example, reportedly stating that there are only two places for Muslims, Khabarstan or Pakistan, the graveyard or Pakistan. The Citizenship Amendment Act and the NRC and NPR must be understood in this context. The NRC and Assam, as, as other panelists have discussed and will discuss in more detail, has shown that the process is rife for abuse by government officials for excluding individuals simply perceived to be foreign regardless of their actual citizenship status. Too often this suspicion of being an illegal migrant is associated with one's religious identity. And as is abundantly evident from the statements of BJP leadership, the Citizenship Amendment Act with its legal protections for non-Muslims is intended to ensure that those excluded from the NRC process and therefore bearing the label of illegal migrant are Muslims alone. It is Muslims who will carry the threat of punitive action from the NRC, including prolonged detention, deporta deportation, or statelessness. In India today, the freedom of religion or belief is being decimated as individuals are targeted simply due to their religious identity in violation of India's own constitution. It is imperative that in US government officials' interactions with their Indian counterparts, these issues are elevated as a US foreign policy priority, communicating the need to protect shared democratic values. The United States has in its arsenal a vast array of tools to promote religious freedom abroad, both through positive engagement and punitive action. These include, for example, the integration of religious freedom in U.S. development programs or law enforcement training, and the use of targeted sanctions against Indian officials primarily responsible for religious freedom violations. India is a country of many diverse cultures, religions, histories, and peoples interacting and overlapping in a civilizational conversation. South Asia has strong traditions of religious harmony and interfaith cooperation, embodied in historical traditions such as Northern India's Ganga Jamuni Tezib, a cultural synthesis between Hindus and Muslims. Hindu nationalists deny this history and religious minorities' place in it, in particular casting aside any part of India's history with an association with Islam, whether that be mosques, names of cities, or even the Taj Mahal. They are, in essence, reinventing the history and social landscape of their country in ways that fit their ideological frame. India is still undergoing the debate that accompanied the struggle for independence. Who is an Indian? The actions of the BJP government, including the Citizenship Amendment Act, NRC, and NPR, are emblematic of its efforts to undo the secularism established at independence, create a Hindu state, and purify the nation of infiltrators. As history has shown us, however, the purification of the land, especially one so rich with diversity, is never a peaceful process. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that lesson, education here. Uh, the, the 
I would like to say here, I think I should make comments about India, since we heard so much about India is not a bad country. Indian society is not a bad society. Indian culture is not a bad culture. Hinduism is not a bad religion. The problem is RSS. And RSS is not confined to India. They are not coming here. They are here. They are here running many organizations, charitable organizations, using tax-deductible status, and working under the cover, sometimes very overtly. They are here. American society needs to know that, and American society needs to understand the implications of it. What we are concerned about CAA is about India. M me, as an American citizen, I am concerned about America. And all Americans should be concerned about it. RSS is here, perhaps in this room as well. So please make note of it. So next, uh, next set of speakers. Thank you. I invite uh, uh, my good friend Nihad Awad here, the executive director of CARE, and uh, Iman Awad, national legislative director of Engage, and uh, Sunita Srinivasan from Hindus for Human Rights. Again, we are very grateful to co-sponsorship of uh, uh, CARE, Engage and uh, uh, Sunita from Hindus for Human Rights. I'm sure some of you probably got uh, invites for this uh, this briefing, and we are very grateful for that uh, that support and other support they always provide us. I to to start with, I will invite uh, uh, Nihad Awad, Executive Director of Care, to speak. Good morning. I'm Nihad Awad, the National Executive Director of CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, the US largest Muslim civil rights and advocacy organization. We are a proud co sponsor of this very important briefing on the situation in India. You don't have to be Indian Americans, you don't have to be Indian to care about what's happening in India. I'm not an expert on India, but I will speak as a human being. I'll speak as an American. India has inspired the world as the oldest and largest democracy. The country of Mahatma Gandhi. The people who protested injustice for decades and paid with their own lives to make India the country that has inspired all of us around the world through many generations. However, for hundreds of years, there have been many atrocities that have taken place, and some of them continue to take place. We, the current generation, may not be responsible for not knowing or taking action to prevent such atrocities. For example, African Americans and the enslavement of Africans had happened for hundreds of years. It's getting better because so many people have spoken out against it. But discrimination continues to take place against African Americans today, despite the beautiful constitution that we have. I was struck to know today, to discover that the first few words of the U.S. Constitution and the preamble of the Indian Constitution are the same. We the people. We the people. That's, that's inspiring. That shows the importance of how democracies emerge. However, despite the fact that we the people in the United States, African Americans, have been discriminated and killed for centuries until today, Secondly, the Holocaust happened, not in our generation, in the previous generation. What led to atrocities like the Holocaust, like Rwanda, like Bosnia, it did not happen overnight. 
it happened with the legitimization of discrimination against other, the demonization, uh, dehumanization of others, creating policies and legislation and false sense on the base of false sense of superiority to give legitimacy to the state, to the non-state actors to discriminate, to commit violence against people, to pass legislation, to make it legal, to exclude people from equal treatment in their own societies. But today, on our watch, we see other forms and new and fresh atrocities taking place, such as the genocide in Myanmar, the internment camps in China, and potentially internment camps and atrocities in India. Despite the fact that India has inspired the world for generations, India is now scaring the world because of what's my, what might ha be happening. So, to the staffers, to the representatives of Congress people here, both in the House and the Senate, it should not happen on your watch. You should work with and help and inspire your representatives to hold hearings about this. It is important. It is not a partisan issue, it is a human rights issue. What's happened in India impacts millions of people in India and it impacts the U.S. relations here. And we as Americans have to say something. It is our generation. Don't be condemned by the next generation because you're silent today. It's simple and clear. I believe that the Foreign Relations Committee in both the House and the Senate should conduct hearings and should investigate and take the recommendations that have been presented to put pressure on India to protect its religious minorities and to hold India accountable to its commitments to the human rights conventions, we can do it. I have been inspired by what I heard from personal stories, by eyewitnesses, by experts, by advocates, by human rights activists, and I would like to be inspired by those who are here in the audience, what kind of action you will take. We at CARE are going to be in support of any legislative action and any shift in our policy, shift away from being silent to protect the religious minority in India because in a globalized world, what's happening in India today could happen here. And even if it doesn't happen here, we should be alert, we should be worried because it is the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Nihad. Uh, I hope more people will join your call and we get to some action here in United States. Uh, I invite now uh, <coughs> Iman Awad, who is the National Legislative Director of Engage Action. Uh, everybody has her bio, please. Good morning. Uh, as it was mentioned, my name is Iman Awad. I'm the National Legislative Director at Engage Action. We are a Muslim American advocacy organization and honored to be joining today the Indian American Muslim Council, our partners with CARE and Hindus for Human Rights. Um, we've heard the experts speak uh, and part of what I wanted to discuss today is the importance of having our civil society be involved in this fight. I think that Nahad just brilliantly laid out that it is within our own obligations to speak up and to speak out. One thing I took away from listening to all the speakers is that we are witnessing people in India, people in Kashmir, journalists in Burma and Myanmar and China being detained for having an opinion. Yet we're all sitting in this room, we're all behind a microphone, we have these big banners and in the halls and in the seat of power in the United States, we can all have this conversation. We can talk about the abuses, at times it can seem daunting, 
I just listed off other countries that are having their own internal issues with genocide and detentions and human rights abuses and even within our own corners we might feel like it's a little bit hopeless right now in our political climate. But I think it's a win that we're able to sit here today. Uh, as a Muslim organization, we like to follow one of our hadiths, one of our faith sayings that whosoever sees an injustice must change it with their hand. If they're unable to change it with their hand, they must change it with their heart. If they're unable to change it with their, oh, sorry, sorry, their tongue, and if you're unable to change it with your tongue, you change it with your heart which is the weakest of faith. I think in all of our faith tradition, whether you're Hindu, Christian, Muslim, whatever you believe, there calls a power that we are supposed to speak up and speak out. And we're really honored to be a part of that today. And we hope that we take this information that we've learned and we continue to engage Congress on this. Thank you. Thank you, Iman, for that uh, solidarity. Our next speaker should have been um, Sarah Anderson. Uh, it, uh, she couldn't make it here. She had given, uh, uh, Sunita Vishwanathan had given her time graciously for her, but now that she couldn't come, we are giving her time to Sunita. Since her bio is not here, I'll just uh, do a quick uh, read. Sunita Vishwanathan uh, has worked in women's and human rights organization for almost three decades. She is a co-founder and active board member of the 14-year-old, now I think longer than that, Frontline Women's Human Rights Organization, Women for Afghan Women. Sunita is also co-founder and board member of Sadhna, Coalition of Progressive Hindus, Living and Building a Hinduism that prioritizes social, social justice and upholding the Hindu principles of ekata oneness, ahimsa, nonviolence, and and sadhana faith in action. Sunita is being uh, Sunita has honored for her work with sadhana to encourage Hindus to live out these principles by taking care of environment. She was honored by White House as change champions of change. Thank you. Thank you all. I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, I just want to say it was the previous White House. <laughs> um, I have just come back from India. I was there for a month um, and I'm a little bit dazed. I came back um, on a long, long journey, pretty much walked into yesterday's protests. I was in New York City in the huge, I don't know, it, it felt like um, 5,000 people or more. Um, it was very, very exciting to walk from the protests in India to the protests in New York and around the, in, around, and around the country and now to be here in this very, very important group of people um, paying attention to India. Um, I just want to give you um, a quick sort of synopsis of my trip. As was mentioned, I work in Afghanistan, and whenever I go to Afghanistan, my family is very, very nervous for my safety. I cannot tell you how nervous my family was for my safety on this trip to India. I traveled with um, activists, including Sandeep Pandey, and um, I, I did this to be in solidarity and I got a taste of what it is like to be an activist on the front line in India today. You do not know in the morning whether that evening you will be in jail. You, there is surveillance of the magnitude I have never experienced in my life and I know the reason Sandeep was talking about when we tried to go to Ayodhya, the reason they knew to be outside his door to, be, to kind of, uh, they were with us. They were our chaperone all the way, halfway to Ayodhya. The way they knew that was because he's being watched every step. And he's just one out of countless brave frontline activists in India. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know what it, I, I, my hat's off to people like Sandeep who's, and so many others with you who's, whose lives are in danger. And, and yet, every single day they stand up and enter the protest. He, he talked about Mohammed Shreb. Um, one of the activists in Lucknow. I saw in the news, because when I was there in Lucknow, he was still in prison and we visited his family. I saw in the news that he was released from prison and he walked straight into the protest. This kind of, um, Somia said, selfless protest, it is so inspiring. When I went to India... <laughs> 
When I went to India, I must say I wasn't feeling very hopeful. And now I'm more hopeful. Um, it isn't, it, the protests are very inspiring, but it's still a very, very dark, dark moment. Um, my visit started with visits, with, with uh, time spent with Raj Mohan Gandhi and Anand Teltumde. Raj Mohan Gandhi is a grandson of Mahatma Gandhi. Anand Teltumde is the grandson-in-law of B.R. Ambedkar, two of the fathers of India. Both of these men are very, very concerned for their country. Um, Raj Mohan Gandhi at age 84 is taking part in the advocacy to, to, to defend India, Indian constitution and Indian democracy. And Anand Teltumde is any day maybe being put back in prison for strange trumped up charges of, um, I, I don't fully understand it, but apparently he tried to kill Narendra Modi. It's nonsense. And, and he actually, um, it's one of the chilling moments of my trip. He says, we, he doesn't know what's going to happen, but he predicts a genocide in India. And this is what um, Genocide Watch also recently predicted. Um, I, I went to India on one mission. I'm with Hindus for Human Rights. As a Hindu, all of this that is happening, all this um, alarm bell ringing, it is happening on the back of my religion. It's happening in the name of my religion. And that is not OK with me. And that is not OK with Hindus of conscious, con conscience. I went to India to find validation for my path, my mission. And I found, thanks to Sandeep and other friends of mine, they took me to find brave Hindus who are standing up against this atrocity. And I want to name the brave Hindus that I met in the holiest parts of India, in Ayodhya. And I finally made it to Ayodhya, because when you're not traveling with Sandeep, you can actually get around. <laughs> So I made it to, oh, let me, so the, the Mahant, the head of the temp, small temple, Ranjan, Ram Janki Temple in Ayodhya, which is right adjacent to the disputed site of the, Bab, the demolished Babri Masjid, right there in that red zone he lives and raises his voice. When we tried to make it to visit him, not, word was out that we were on that, our way. We got a call from him that police had come and put him in hospital against his will. And they told him that if, even if we made it, they, we could visit the temple, but we could not visit him. And then when I finally made it to Ayodhya another way, um, I, I had my visit. I spoke to him. We left. And then police arrived. Um, and, and I don't know. They didn't do anything. But they, they this thing about surveillance is very, very real. Um, Sandeepji and um, this uh, priest in Ayodhya and some other activists are in the process of dreaming up a multi-faith harmony center in Ayodhya. And Hindus for Human Rights pledges to be with you in that very holy pursuit. <laughs> I'll just name the other priests that I met. Mahant Rajesh Tiwari in Varanasi. Um, uh, Mahant Vishwambar Nath Mishra in Vana Varanasi. And you know this is Banaras, the holiest Hindu city. So these two priests in Banaras are speaking up as Hindus against Hindutva. I have the validation I need for the path of Hindus for human rights. There's one more priest that I met in Kerala. His name is Subramaniam. He, he is getting a lot of heat for speaking up against CAA. But he told me, for him, there is no, the, the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, our holy book, and the Indian constitution are one. So please, as we do our work, let's remember that this atrocity that's happening, this Hindu extremism, this Hindu fascism, is not Hinduism. And wherever you can in your work, find Hindu voices to speak up against this, um, this aberration of our faith. Thank you. We are done here. Thank you very much for everybody coming for a time. And we will be out there for anybody who has any specific questions with the speaker. Thank you.